Thank you, colleagues. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 108. This is a one-minute division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Stephanie Callaghan for a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I would have voted no, my app's not working. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 108 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 94, no 16. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. There were 16 abstentions. 16 abstentions. Yes, I should, of course, have notified you that there were 16 abstentions. Point of order, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I seek your guidance under the Scottish Parliament Standing Orders Rule 16.1.3, uh, which states that the clerk shall arrange for minutes of proceedings to be published as soon as possible by whatever means is considered appropriate. Uh, it is obviously vital that the full results of amendments in this place are made public as soon as possible, because as we saw from last night, there is significant public interest in the proceedings going on in this place, particularly in relation to the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Now, last night, the detail of the results of the Gender Recognition Reforms amendments voted on yesterday were passed on to members of, um, of parliamentarians and their staff at 17 minutes past midnight after the conclusion of the debate and many hours after some of the amendments had been voted on. And this, is, I think, is completely understandable, uh, given the circumstances, uh, except uh, had I not learned of the following developments this morning. The presiding officer, I can reveal today that the detailed results of these amendments were passed from parliamentary officials to journalists hours before they were received by elected parliamentarians. At 9.04 in the evening, the detailed results of amendments were passed on to journalists more than three hours before being received by MSPs and their staff in this place. Uh, and on top of that, uh, these amendments results were not made publicly available for anyone to access. This, of course, meant that the details of yesterday's proceedings were not published as soon as possible, because this information was not made public through the proper channels. And even, uh, though, and even as I'm aware, the detailed results of all the amendments voted on last night have only just been published on the official report in the last hour. So can I clarify what measures are being taken to ensure that the standing orders of this place are being adhered to, uh, in particular with regards to the details of the proceedings being made publicly available to everyone as soon as possible and not just a select group? Thank you. I thank Mr Burnett. I thank Mr Burnett for his point of order. The rules do require that minutes are published as soon as possible by whatever means is considered appropriate. I am aware that divisions were notified to business managers um, as soon as possible. I believe um, that this was as close to the suspension of our, our proceedings last night as possible. Obviously, officials need, Mr Burnett will understand, that officials need time to ensure that the minutes are correct before there are any published and that there were several hours of business that had to be checked through before that publication 
took place, and we had an exceptionally late sitting last night, as everyone appreciates. I will look into the points that Mr Burnett raises with regard to information being available to, to some before others. Thank you. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. I think it is important to ascertain from the Chair, the presiding officer, that it would be inappropriate for that information to have gone to journalists ahead of parliamentarians. I think that is a fundamental. I would be grateful to have your ruling on that. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I have just ruled on the point raised by Mr Burnett, and I did say in that ruling that I would look into that matter. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 50 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 18? Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We will move to division and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 50 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 62, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to group 11, late application for review of Registrar General's decision. And I call amendment 109 in the name of Jamie Green in a group on its own. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Hopefully a slightly less contentious group of amendments. Single amendment in this, amendment 109 and it is around late application for review of Register General's decisions. Um, we know, uh, uh, officer, unfortunately, uh, many transgender lives can be filled with much disruption and instability due to a wide range of socio-economic factors. Um, I have spoken to a number of individuals who have already gone through the GRC process or are about to. Um, some do not have regular addresses, some have wider health physical both and mental health problems and often require medical supervision or, supervision or indeed intervention. As currently drafted on the bill, an individual seeking to obtain a GRC but has had their application refused for, for, for whatever reason does have the right to an appeal. That appeal uh, must be made within 40 working days. Uh, there are provisions at the moment that allow the Register General to consider an appeal after this period, if they so wish, but they are not required to. I am concerned that if, for example, there is a higher number of applications uh, or, indeed, uh, additions to the duties that fall within the Register General's remit as a result of some of the amendments that may or may not pass, this 40-day deadline may indeed become a strict blanket deadline, irrespective of the circumstances of the applicant. I am of the view, sympathetically, that if a person were to have good reason for missing this deadline, perhaps, for example, due to hospital admission, sickness, change of living circumstances or a family emergency, then this should be taken into account when an appeal is submitted late. In one second. Amendment 109 is a relatively simple one. It does allow for late appeals, but only if the Registrar General is satisfied that the applicant had good reason for not making the request sooner. Uh, who was first? Uh, Liam Kerr. Uh, it's just uh, by way of clarification, if away for the member, it, it, I think what he's talking about 
uh, and I, I, I followed the, the articulation of it, but I think what he's talking about is that uh, you can come in it later if you have a good reason. Now, I appreciate the member gave some examples, but is there going to be guidance on what constitutes a good reason? And if not, who is the arbiter of what constitutes good in the reason? Yeah, as, as stated, the, the amendment says that if the request is made after that period, the Register General must comply with the request if, it, if he or she is satisfied that the applicant had good reason for not making it sooner. Um, but, may, uh, but may, but not need to comply with it if not satisfied. Um, it doesn't specify any, any grounds for which uh, a scenario would be given. I think the concept of guidance is a very helpful one, actually. I might ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary to reflect on that in, in closing comments. Um, I think it would perhaps benefit uh, from there, there, there will be guidance associated with other, many other parts of this bill. This may be a good example where, rather on the face of the bill, we put prescriptive uh, 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 scenarios that the Register General must adhere to, but give some flexibility to the Register General, who I, who I trust their judgment on, on whether they believe that the applicant had good reason to make a late application. But certainly, of course, some, some, some parameters around that and guidance to the Registrar General will be very helpful, given that the nature of the role of the Registrar General, and it's a point that we haven't really properly debated in all of this, is changing as a result of this legislation. And I think it does deserve um, you know, some, some wider airtime, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that as, as the day goes on. But yes, I, I, I don't disagree with the comments made by the member. Was there, was there another, another intervention? Same point. Okay, I hope I've answered that. Um, no further comments on that amendment. Presiding officer, thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. I call on the Cabinet Secretary to respond. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Hopefully, I'll be similarly uh, brief. Under the, the terms of the, the Bill as introduced, the Registrar-General must comply with a request for a review if it's made within 40 days of the application being determined and may but need not comply if the request is made after that time. Amendment 109 provides further clarification on the discretion provided to the Registrar-General to deal with late applications and is a helpful clarification of the review process and I'm happy to support and I can confirm uh, to Jamie Green and others that the National Records of Scotland will uh, do guidance and the Registrar-General will apply to the individual circumstances using their judgment. Thank you. Jamie Green to wind up press or withdraw Amendment 109. Mr Green. Uh, happy to see that uh, further clarification uh, on the role that NRS will play in producing guidance. I, I hope that addresses any concerns that members had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. The question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote's closed. <coughs> and the result of the vote on amendment number 109 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 116, no, 4. There were five abstentions. That amendment is therefore uh, agreed to. Uh, I call Amendment 52 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 18. Russell Finlay can move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. There will be division. Members should cast their votes now.
and the vote's closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 52 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 61, no 63. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 53 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 18. Mr Finlay to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should pa uh, cast the votes now. And the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 53 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 60, no 62. Uh, there were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 110 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with Amendment 108. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 110 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 92, no 13. There were 19 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We now move to Group 12, manifestly unfounded application to Sheriff to revoke certificate. I call Amendment 51 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy in a group on its own. Pam Duncan Glancy uh, to move and speak to Amendment 51. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I wish to speak to Amendment 51 in my name. The function of the person of interest at Section 8S in this legislation is essential. It makes provision for someone with a genuine interest in a person's GRC application to intervene and express concern that the application has been made fraudulently or that the person was coerced or did not understand the, the effect of obtaining the certificate. The definition of a person of interest has been drawn more widely in this bill than was in the 2004 Act to take account of the changed process proposed and Scottish Labour support that definition. My amendment seeks to provide proportionality to this function in the Bill so that it serves the purpose it is intended and is not used as a means to unfairly block a GRC application. This amendment will give the Sheriff due restriction to determine that an application under Section 8S 
is manifestly unfounded. That it is to say that the person making the application to the sheriff has malicious intent, is using the re request with no real purpose other than to cause disruption, makes unsubstantiated accusations against or is targeting the applicant because they have a problem with them, unless it is proved on the balance of probabilities that it is not. The amendment transfers the burden of proof to the respondent in any civil proceedings so that it is for them to prove the GRC application should be revoked, ensuring it is not for the GRC applicant to disprove any claims made against them. My amendment 51 clarifies that evidence used to prove a fraudulent GRC application cannot be based on personal feelings toward the applicant nor their view on gender reassignment itself. Applications under the person of interest powers are important, but they must be based on evidence that transcends personal opinion. I am confident that this amendment will address concerns that a person of interest who disapproves of a trans person's identity and their right to exist may use the courts to interfere in a GRC application. I will. Liam Kerr. Uh, I am very grateful. I just want to make sure that the member is going to ad address this, uh, which you may be going on to do. At the, at the end of this clause, the definition of there's a definition of manifestly unfounded, and it finishes by saying that that turns on it having no, quote, evidential basis. It does, is the, can the member help me understand, is there any specification of what might constitute evidence for that evidential basis, and or is there a, a threshold around sufficiency? Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the member for the intervention and the language that is used in this part of the amendment was taken from the data protection um, legislation and also around FOIs, um, information around FOIs. And so there is already some precedence in how to look at that. But ultimately, this would be a matter for a sheriff to determine because at this point, a sheriff has already been involved because the person of interest function has been, has been invoked. And so the sheriff, it would be for the sheriff to determine whether or not there was evidence. And I hope that, that helps um, the, the member and provides the clarity that they need. In my view, we must protect trans people from manifestly unfounded claims. And I believe that this is something in which all of us in this chamber can agree. We also believe, as I've said, that the, power, the, the person of interest function is incredibly important. We believe that together with this amendment and the person of interest function, we have a suite of protections that ensure that trans people and other people get what they need from this legislation. And I urge colleagues to support this amendment. And I move, I, I will. Stephen yes. But does she also accept that this provision for the award of damages may put off people who have genuine concerns, but would be afraid of this element of the bill. But maybe that is her deliberate design. I don't think it is. But does she accept that this could have a serious dissuading influence over people who have genuine concerns, but are terrified of what that might mean if the court ruled something differently than they would hope it would? that it would put them off completely. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for the intervention. And, and no, I don't, because I believe if those concerns are genuine, then they would be able to prove that. They would be able to have the evidence that would be required. So the definition of man malicious intent and, ma and manifestly unfounded, rather, is that it has malicious intent, is using the request with no real purpose other than to cause disruption, and makes unsubstantiated accusations. Anyone who can make substantiated accusations, who therefore has, in, in the member's words, a genuine concern shouldn't be put off by this part of the legislation. It isn't designed to deter them. It is designed to deter people who may wish to frustrate the, the process for trans people who I think we all believe need access to this system. And even people who have voiced concerns about this bill, I believe, recognise that trans people who need to change their, their legal gender should not be blocked from doing so just because somebody doesn't agree with their acquired gender status. And so with that, President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glassy. And I call uh, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank uh, Pam Duncan Glancy for bringing forward this uh, amendment and for her uh, explanation of it. Uh, it references unfounded applications under Section 85, which allows for gender recognition certificates to be revoked on application to a sheriff if the sheriff is satisfied that on the balance of probabilities the application was fraudulent. Where a sheriff makes this finding, they must revoke the certificate or take other action as appropriate in the specifics of the case. Now, I understand Pam Duncan Glancy's intent in bringing forward this particular amendment, but having considered it very carefully, uh, I'm concerned that it is confused and it does throw up a number of legal difficulties. 
Uh, the amendment seeks to make a provision that would allow sheriffs to determine that an application to revoke a gender recognition was manifestly uh, unfounded. So a uh, sheriff finding an application was, uh, as with an application that was fraudulent, a sheriff can judge an application for revocation was unfounded on the balance of probabilities. And uh, as has just been mentioned by my colleague Stephen Kerr, the section would also allow for the award of compensation where injured feelings are found to have occurred as a result of a manifestly unfounded application for revocation. And this manifestly unfounded application for revoking a gender recognition certificate is defined as one that was intentionally misleading, made in accordance with the applicant's feelings about gender recognition certificates, and had no evidential basis. Now, there are a number of issues with this, and we've, we have, over the course of the, the afternoon already, had quite lengthy debates around this whole very difficult issue of fraudulent applications and this question of evidence. Somebody can apply for a gender recognition certificate with no evidence whatsoever. That is the whole principle behind self-identification. They are not required to say, they are not required to, for example, change their appearance or change their pronouns. They are not required to change the way they dress. Uh, these are not requirements for obtaining a gender recognition certificate. So I really struggle to see what the evidential basis that is referred to uh, in this particular amendment would actually refer to, because none of these things are prerequisites for the obtaining of a gender recognition certificate if we accept the principle of self-identification. So, uh, yes, of course. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking the intervention and all of the things that the member has just outlined are, are not current requirements of what people have to prove in order to access your gender recognition certificate and so this amendment neither changes nor affects any of those provisions. Murdo Fraser. Yeah, I, I accept that point by Pan Tung Glancy but with respect I don't think it actually strengthens her case because she is putting forward an amendment that refers to evidential basis and effectively she is now I'm afraid arguing against herself by saying these things are not currently uh, required. Now, so, so what we're doing is we're creating a mechanism with an ill-defined uh, threshold uh, and, and therefore throwing it on to sheriffs to try and make that judgment against these criteria on the balance of probabilities with no history of case law around these particular areas. And I think it would be extremely difficult for a sheriff to try and make these judgments uh, based on the amendment uh, that's before us. And, and the, the second point is, and it's already been mentioned, the amendment would allow for compensation to be awarded to those who successfully claimed an application was manifestly unfounded. Now, I think there is a genuine worry this will lead to a situation where there are people who know or, or are concerned that a gender recognition certificate was fraudulently claimed, but they won't apply for a revocation because they are worried about the financial consequences on them should that challenge not be successful, should on the balance of probabilities a sheriff reject that challenge, they would then be liable potentially for financial compensation. And that will act as a potential barrier to people seeking to uh, uh, challenge uh, these awards. So I, I, I believe that allowing people to apply for revocation of a gender recognition certificate without fear of litigation is important because of the way that this legislation is opening up the whole process with so many safeguards being removed. Threatening individuals with legal action, if they take up an option to simply apply for review of a grant of a gender recognition certificate should not, in my view, be in this bill. I hope that colleagues will, will support me uh, in opposing this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to respond. Uh, thank you. I know uh, from the evidence provided to the committee and through our own consultations that there is a concern in the trans community about potential misuse of the ability of a person uh, with an interest to apply to a sheriff for a GRC to be revoked, and, and I can understand that. The bill allows for a person who has an interest in a GRC to apply to the sheriff to revoke a certificate on the ground that the application was fraudulent or that the applicant was incapable of understanding the effect of it or that the applicant was incapable of validly making the application. And that is an important safeguard. The person seeking to revoke a certificate would need to have a genuine interest in the certificate in that it would have to affect them personally or professionally and they would be required to produce evidence of their interest and on, of the ground on which the certificate could be revoked. Cabinet Secretary, could you resume your seat? Point right. of order, Tess White. Thank you, officer. As you can see, the gallery, again, is not full. 
There are people, again, who have been refused tickets, who would like to actually witness what's happening today. They've been refused tickets. They've been told they can't access. That's completely unacceptable. And will the, the presiding officer take a view, please? And those women and people who can't get access, please. It might be too late, but there are some who would like access for the empty seats above. Thank you. I thank Ms. White for a point of order. I recognise there was a similar point of order yesterday. Um, there was no evidence that people had been prevented from coming into the building, as far as I'm aware. No. I, I have evidence, and I will I feed that to the. Uh, Ms. White, thank would you, you resume your seat, please? I will not have the chair challenge, Ms. White. I am responding to your point of order. I will respond to your current point of order. I will ask that this matter be looked into. It's not something I can rule on from the chair. As was said yesterday, we would hope and expect any members of the public that wish to attend the proceeding to be in the public gallery that can be accommodated to be allowed to do so. With that, uh, I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to continue her remarks. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, the, the person is seeking to revoke a certificate would have to have a genuine interest in the certificate, and it would have to affect them personally or professionally, and they would be required to produce evidence of their interest and of the ground on which the certificate could be revoked. At stage two, a number of amendments were lodged along similar lines to Amendment 51. I indicated at the time that I was sympathetic to the aims of those amendments and would consider if there was anything that could address those concerns without raising wider access to justice issues. I have not been able to identify any for this bill because existing mechanisms already allow the courts to dismiss groundless applications uh, in the most efficient uh, manner. In a clear case of lack of genuine interest or bad faith, a sheriff could dismiss a case at the first hearing without even having a required GRC holder to formally participate. It is a common statutory requirement that a person has an interest in a particular matter in order to bring proceedings to court, and the courts are used to determining what amounts to a genuine interest. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept, though, that in those proceedings it is on the GRC applicant to... Uh, the burden of proof is on the GRC applicant rather than the person who is applying to revoke the certificate? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let, let me just continue. Um, if a person was to make repeated vexatious applications to revoke the GRCs of different GRC holders, there is an existing provision in the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014 that would allow the Lord Advocate in the public interest to apply to the Court of Session for a vexatious litigation order. And this would require the person to get permission from the Court before making a further application. The courts also have existing powers to properly compensate the GRC holder for their legal expenses and to sanction a malicious applicant through an enhanced award of expenses against them. Now, we will work with the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service on any updates or changes to court rules which are needed as a result of the bill, including where those rules could avoid any negative impacts on the GRC holders which arise from the court proceedings. Now, I consider that the law already provides mechanisms that can be used to respond to a malicious application because, of course, the prospect of litigation being used maliciously is a general issue that is not particular to these circumstances. There does not appear to be anything further that could be achieved in the Bill without either duplicating the existing machinery or restricting access to justice in a way that would be unacceptable. So I'm pleased to say, however, that amendments in Group 15 about the requirement to review the bill will include that we will review the provision allowing applications uh, um, pr review the provision allowing applications to be made to the sheriff and I hope that that would be enough for Pam Duncan Glancy and indeed uh, Maggie Chapman who's also expressed an interest in this uh, to be reassured that we will look and see whether uh, the existing machinery uh, which has worked uh, well uh, to date uh, would uh, also cover the, the issues that Pam Duncan Glancy raises and I hope on that basis that she'll not push her amendment. Thank you. I call Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 51. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And in the interest of brevity, I will be um, brief and as clear as I can and quick. I, I, 
I do not accept some of, the, some of the concerns that were raised by my colleagues opposite around the fact that the deterrent of potentially having um, civil proceedings against someone will stop somebody um, using the person of interest power. I will start where I start, I will come to where I started on this, which is that we believe the person of interest power in this bill is entirely proportionate and we support it. Indeed, we, we voted against narrowing the person of interest power um, at stage two because we think it is incredibly important that it is there. But this, I believe, this amendment, I believe, allows us to bring some proportionality to that and ensure Sure that where someone does use that, they have to bring evidence. And so the point about being worried about not being able to do it because of the level of evidence is not actually going um, is not actually, I, I think, an accurate one because in order to bring an accusation of a fraudulent claim or um, coercion or that someone didn't understand the application, evidence is required anyway. And so the point of this amendment is to say that, that the basis of that evidence was actually not founded and there wasn't enough evidence there to prove that it was, in fact, um, a fraudulent or an unclear application. Um, on the Cabinet Secretary's points about existing legislation, I think, I think those points are, are important, and I welcome the fact that they're in the review, but I still think the burden of proof um, is therefore left on, on the trans person, and I think that we have to be really clear that in this situation we need to ensure that the burden of proof does not sit with the trans person to prove where someone is trying to deliberately um, prevent them from accessing a GRC. And so that's why um, I can't accept that the existing mechanisms are enough. Um, but I will look forward to, to how the review sees this. Um, on that basis, President Officer, I will move the amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members, you cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. <laughs> Point of order, Megan Gallagher, who joins us online. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, my laptop froze and I'm unsure if my vote was recorded. Can I please confirm if it has been? Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. I can confirm that your uh, vote was, in fact, recorded. Thank you. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 51 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 26, no, 98. There were no abstentions. The amendment is, therefore, not agreed. With that, we move to Group 3. Point of order, uh, Rachel Hamilton. Signing officer, thank you. Under Rule 9.10.6, I would like to submit a manuscript amendment to the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill, which would leave out Section 15A. As I understand it, Scottish Parliament guidance on amendments reads, and I quote, if no amendment to leave out the section or schedule has been lodged in advance, any member may lodge a manuscript amendment to leave it out. I can submit the wording to the presiding officer if necessary and if it's not already been done. I hope this can be permitted and I would like to briefly explain why I intend to lodge this manuscript amendment. Section 15A was agreed to as an amendment by the Equalities Committee at Stage 2 of the Proceedings on the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. I, along with my colleague Pam Gosell, abstained on this amendment, which was voted on the 22nd of November 2022. The date is important to remember here. The rush deadline for submitting amendments to the Gender Recognition Bill 
was 12 p.m. on Tuesday, the 13th of December 2022. Just after this deadline, the Court of Session published its ruling on the judicial review from Four Women Scotland regarding whether holding a gender recognition certificate changes the person's sex for the purposes of the Equality Act. Lady Holding ruled, and again I quote, I conclude that in this context, which is the meaning of sex for the purposes of the 2010 Act, sex is not limited to biological or birth sex, but includes those in possession of a GRC obtained in accordance with the 2004 Act. This clearly has a substantial impact on how the Equality Act 2010 is to be interpreted for the purposes of those who hold a gender recognition certificate, which is what the Gender Recognition Reform Bill relates to. But Parliament has not had the ability to decide on this section since this Court of Session ruling, and no amendments could be submitted in time for the Stage 3 deadline, because the ruling was made public after the amendment deadline. Given the importance, presiding officer, of this court ruling in interpreting this Act, I think it is important that the presiding officer accepts the amendment in my name so that the Parliament is able to debate the substantive effect of the Court of Session ruling in relation to how the Equality Act is to be interpreted, as I said, in relation to this Act. I seek, presiding officer, to move the manuscript amendment in my name to leave out section 15A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Hamilton. Uh, as uh, manuscript amendments are a matter either for the convener or for the presiding officer, I'm going to have to suspend uh, this uh, session of the Parliament for the time being.